So I think, thank you all, and uh, I will start. Uh, I would like to take the liberty, however, to present a little bit of my talk in a sort of a lay presentation. And I especially ask the young kids to come for that presentation because they are really the one who should understand best what we are doing, why are we doing that, and what do we really expect from our work. So I am presenting actually none of those human doctors. I represent the mice doctors. And as such, we have really the liberty and the tools to go more into question of mechanism. And in doing that, we expect that by understanding how we lead the leaf for many, what is leaf for many, and how does leaf for many start and end up as such a devastating disease, and what is the mechanism and the steps that lead to that, we hope that by understanding that, we will be able to come with some answers either to block or modify the process, and maybe at the end of the day to come up with some ways of cure. And I think we are very fortunate to have this session where there are already some such evidence, some such studies that show, yes, we can do something about it. Not too much, you can, we still expect for more, but we are on the way. So, uh, the talk of today is really dealing with the fact that uh, all about it is that we have in our genome this wild type P53, which is the good angel, which is referred as the guardian. And I think the first gardener was David Lane, who coined this man there, who coined the name of guardian of the genome. And basically, it says all P53, the wild type, the good one, is taking care of our genome and makes sure that everything is always perfect. The genome never settles on more than 100% fidelity. But then one day, this guardian of the genome, which is at the end of the day just a gene, is undergoing a mutation too, is undergoing a change in the DNA, and there is nobody to take care of this situation. And this is when a mutant P53 is losing its important function as a guardian of a genome, that's not the end of the story, it becomes actually the enemy of the genome, and basically not only protecting us, but also helping us or helping the cell to become more transformed. And you probably heard the term oncogenic gain of function, which is really telling, I think, the whole story. And because there are children here, uh, I thought I will give you a picture that my granddaughter drew after I gave a talk in her school as a second grader. And I said, Inbal, what do you learn from what I said? She said, first of all, I'm very upset. I said, why are you upset? Varda, you are killing mice. I really think it's bad. <laughs> and then the second sentence, she said, well, I made you a little drawing. And the drawing is that there is a good angel, which is our wild type P53, and one day he's really getting corrupted and becomes really a very bad angel. And the whole story is about how are these two talking with each other. This is one of the early sections that I stained for P53. Many years ago, when we still had the very early antibodies that we got again from the gardener, from David Lane, who has a factory of antibodies and gives out everyone these important tools. And you see, we stained these sections, not really knowing if it's a good P53 or a bad P53, but in the last couple of days, you heard that when there is a tumor, then there's a lot of mutant P53 just lying in the cell and is there and can re be easily recognized as a bad protein within a cell, and this is really cancer from the column, where you see mutant P53 is accumulating and making the cells really very bad. Now I will jump, just go very fast. There's a lot of research. There are many people who contributed to that. And again, we are asking, how is all this happening? And our idea is that 
What is really happening is that in every tumor develops for a, from a certain origin, and that origin is referred as a stem cell, as a parental cell, as something which is somehow hidden in the body, and usually is a good one, but once there is a mutation in that stem cell, it becomes what some of us believe and some do not, cancer stem cell, and these cancer stem cell, when they have a mutant P53, are really the origin of cancer development. So there is a very nice, there are models you can always speculate, and this is our model that you have here, a, a good wild type P53 that does good things, but when they, one day it becomes a mutant P53, Mutant P53 is not good because it kills or prevents all the good functions that the wild type P53 is doing and helps out the situation to become more a cancer stem cell, and this is really leading to a cancer development. This is another beautiful illustration to tell you a good stem cell is going towards making good tissues, good differentiation, helping out the function of the body, but sometimes when the stem cell is undergoing a change, one of them can be regarded as expression of mutant P53, then you have the development of cancer stem cells, and they are believed to be the origin of cancer. So, you understand that mutations are really important, and the mutations are really the root of the problem. They are somatic tumors, they are tumors that occur in the entire population, but they are the special uh, mutations which are related to the leaf for many, and they are these mutations that are being, unfortunately, being inherited in the family. But what is exactly the situation in this case? As you saw these many pictures, David's picture I use all the time, that's his photo. And uh, in these families, there is a certain, everyone showed you different families, it's amazing how many different types you have, but basically, this family carry a situation where every, cell, every gene has two partners, but in the leaf for many, we are born with one good partner, with one good P53, one wild P53, and one mutated P53. So all when we say somebody is a carrier, it means he has one good angel still and one bad, chromosome, uh, one bad allele. So our general idea was really to focus around the question of the process of LOH, and that is, I'm sure you know the process, the process of LOH is when you, have, you are born or you are a carrier for leaf for how many, where one allele is normal, the other allele is mutant. As long as this situation exists, there are no tumor. All carriers of leaf for how many carry the mutation in the entire body. Every cell you take from their body is structured like that. But sometimes, one cell, or maybe a stem cell, is undergoing a very interesting process, which is loss of heterozygosity. This is heterozygote. You have one good and one bad. And in LOH, in the loss of heterozygosity, you lose the good one and you replicate the bad one, and this is when you lose control of normal life. This is when a cell is developing a cancer. So in simple word, a leaf for many carrier, most of his cells, even though they carry a certain defect, they are still functioning as normal. The problem starts, which takes time to lose one of this good allele, good partner, and duplicate the bad partner. And you can see here, this is quite old data, and we know even today more that, and this is really one of the things that I took from Arnie's lecture. Arnie Levine is going maybe to show the same slide. And there is here a certain incidence of LOH, either when you come from a leaf or many syndrome tumor, or you come from any tumor. In all these situations, basically, the same thing occurs. You lose the good guardian, and you duplicate the bad guardian. And here, this is for the special kids, which are running all the time in the corridor, and ask me great questions, like somebody asked me today, 
do I have to be born as lipomani or can one create a situation of lipomani? And later I will answer you that question, which is a real, really important question. But let me first tell you the genetics of the whole situation. When somebody is a non-lipomani person, he has a non-lipomani genomic police, which is, I told you that P53 is the guardian of the genome. You can look at it as a police. The police takes care of the fidelity of your genome in many ways, fix or kills or whatever. You have to be perfect. You have always two good P53 guardians. Now, when you are, <laughs> A leaf for many, the leaf for many people have a leaf for many genomic police. So they have, as I told you, one good policeman, unfortunately one which is corrupted. But as long as you have a good policeman, you are in peace. This is no harm. <laughs> Corruption is money, but I meant genes, mutations. I couldn't find a better picture. So, <laughs> so this is the situation which you all carry, you can be healthy, you don't have tumors, this is an excellent situation. But kids, when you lose the good guardian, you are left with two corrupted policemen. And then, this is the situation where we are facing. This cell has lost the good thing and is left now with two corrupted policemen that, not, that are not doing the job. And our question is now to understand this system, to understand how LOH is occurring. It's biology. We should learn how, to, how that happens. And second, maybe we can send these corrupted policemen to a school and re-educate them to become good policemen. So you, hear, you see here that us scientists take two different strategies. Maybe other takes 10 different strategies, but I'm just telling you two. One is to keep the situation with a good one, with a bad one, and don't let them lose the good one. The second one is, you have two bad ones, let's re-educate them. Now I will be a little bit sophisticated and apologize to you over there, Libby, Luna, and all the others. So we were using really Mona. We are using really a very interesting model of stem cells. Again, what are stem cells? I tell you, that is believed to be the origin. Some do believe, some do not. There is still a controversial on that. But we believe that there are stem cells and there are a couple of types of stem cells. There are stem cells which we are born from, embryonic stem cells. This is the youngest and the most potent stem cells. They are called pluripotent. They have the capacity to do the world. Then. There is a person who got a Nobel Prize who could show that you can generate almost embryonic stem cells from your skin. In other words, you can revert all cells to embryonic stem cells. So we use that system too. It's a very interesting system. And then the last system that I would like to refer are the adult stem cell. So in our skin, for example, we renew ourselves this is an old or mature differentiated tissue, but still there are their stem cells. Let me remind you that the most important stem cells that are relevant to the leaf for many are actually this, uh, these uh, adult stem cells because we know that cancer develops in adult life and not an embryonic life. And I will tell you in a minute what can we learn from all this situation. Embryonic stem cells, they are the top. Adult stem cells, they are okay, but not that pluripotent as the embryonic stem cells. So somebody said here, well, people, we have to work on human, forget about the mice. It is correct. We all want to work on human, but in human, you heard what people are doing, what doctors are doing. They are now at the face of collecting information. They tell you this family had that mutation, they have this mutation, and everything is being compared, and that is what is called compiling big data. 
In a couple of years, that will be the way to solve the problem. But today, we still have to use models to mimic the situation of the leaf from many in order to understand the process of loss of heterozygosity or any process of which is occurring in the leaf from many. So I just took this, I hope it's okay. This is the leaf from many mouse model. So here you have a daddy, which is a healthy daddy, has two alleles, which are two good policemen. Here there is a mom which has two bad, two bad alleles. This is not usually the situation in human, but the combination, the marriage of these two are actually generating baby leaf or many, which is exactly the model of a human leaf or many, because it has one mutant and one wild type of 53. So for us here, this experimental model, this marriage that generated for us a suitable model of these kind of mice which are representing a leaf for many model. And actually all the basic researchers at the moment are looking in that model and everyone refers to them as Gigi's mice because she was the first one to generate all this combination of taking out a good P53, putting in a bad P53, breeding the mice and generate everything that brings at the end of the day to a model that can use, be used for leaf from any investigation. And this is just to tell you, not only mice, we actually can follow the process. And here, this is a very simple technique where you can measure the good allele, the bad allele, and the good allele. And you don't have to be really a top scientist to understand that the mutant allele is there all the time, and we are losing the wild type 53 allele. And that is exactly what is happening in tumors. And there are tools, and you can follow, and you can stage. So here you see you can stage what time in the life of these cells they become totally a mutant looking, when are they half looking, halfway looking, and you can really design experiments which we basic researchers know how to look on the change of the pattern of these genes. And once you understand which genes are going up and which genes are going down in this process, basic researchers will take advantage of that and develop reagents which will antagonize or abolish this kind of changes. So this is really one strategy, and we are really deep into that strategy with an effort to isolate the genes which are really controlling the process of, of loss of heterozygosity. Now, let's go back. This was an experiment. Let's go back to the embryonic cells. You know that most of the time, uh, leaf for many carriers they, they have babies which are, no, 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 eh, no, are born normal and they present a normal situation. So let's have a look into leaf for many embryonic stem cells. A mother who is leaf for many and she has, um, she's pregnant with a baby. So the baby, that baby or these embryonic stem cells are really nicely isolated. We can isolate them. We can take them from the mother which is heterozygous or from a mouse which is heterozygous and they do normal functions. They behave as normal embryonic stem cells. When you go one step ahead and you look into to their genotype, which is the structure of the genes, you see that they carry the bad one and the good one all the time. So when there is a baby, the baby is not undergoing LOH. The baby has the two forms, but is not losing anything. And this is when you have a good policeman and a bad policeman, and the baby is perfect, is born normal. So this system is nice to see, but not good to take any advantage of it, because there's no LOH. So you can study, but in a minute you see what we can do with that information. That tells you again that they are perfect, and they are growing fine and developing fine. So that was not a good enough tool for us at that moment. The next step was really to devise these in vitro, in culture ma making stem cells, which are almost like the embryonic stem cells. And here this is a very interesting 
a method and you can show that you can generate stem cells. These are beautiful stem cells when you have a wild type P53 and they behave normal and they are perfect. They don't make tumors. They are excellent. They develop mice, exactly what you expect. Now when you take a mutant, a mutated such IPS, such in vitro developed system, you will see that at first sight they are okay. But when you look a little bit deeper, when they have a mutant in these stem cells, they, when they have a mutant, they already develop tumors. So again, wow. <laughs> I give two talks, one to the lay and one to the egg. It's the end of the day, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, fast. So I will just tell you that we took advantage of these IPS, and we learned that these IPS are very interesting. They look at the beginning very much like normal. This is mutant, and these are like normal. You see, they are almost the same. But with time, they are undergoing LOH. They are undergoing LOH, but not to the best satisfaction. Because, because we had some which do not undergo LOH, you see they have these two bands, and some which undergo LOH, and, and, and some which go less under LOH. So there is a model, but not good enough. So we searched yet for another model, and that other model was to look in adult stem cells. And we look into adult stem cells. I will go very briefly. It's a method, again, you take bone marrow, you cook it in the lab, eventually you get stem cells, and these are undergoing perfect LOH. And they can tell you that they can really present the cells which are important to develop tumors. And indeed, we have this diagram which tells you that embryonic stem cells do not undergo LOH of any kind, but adult stem cells more or less undergo LOH. So adult stem cell is the best model that we are studying now to understand the process of LOH. This is a very interesting diagram to tell you that when you are still very early stem cells, you cannot undergo LOH, only if you advance in your maturation. And this is actually the system that we are using. We are taking these adult stem cells and we are letting them develop in vitro. And you can see here, these are the ones that, that have mutant. This is like a leaf for many patient. At the beginning, they don't undergo LOH, but eventually they do undergo LOH. And when they are like that, they do produce tumors. So we are zooming on this and we are learning what is really happening that they convert into a a mutant-like uh, tumor. So this approach we expect actually to give you one solution, and that is to prevent the onset of LOH. Somehow we will freeze the situation. Somebody asked me before, can you sort of, once we have already this syndrome, can you prevent it? That will be the approach. We will understand how it happens, so we probably understand how to block it, and that will be preventive medicine. Okay, here is back to the family. And back to the family was important for us as scientists, even though this is not in real life. There's not a mom which has two bad policemen. There's always a mom with one bad policeman or one good policeman. But in mice, you can have mice which are born even though they have no good P53 at all, they have too bad, they have a gene which is mutated. So then that is really a puzzle. How come you have a mutated gene and only a mutated gene, you don't develop tumors and you are normal? And that was really a very important observation that led us to another way of thinking. And the way of thinking was, let's look what's happening to that mutated policeman, to that mutated protein. So we start looking onto that, and that we understood a very important observation, that when you look into these embryos, even though by genetics they are fully mutant, there is nothing to call for the good one, the protein still has some look of a wild type of the good one, and some look of a mutant. 
So this is, has no genetic explanation. We had to look on another explanation, and that is to move one level. You look on the genes, you learn a lot. But what really counts and dictates the nature of a cell is the proteins. So we thought that maybe, you know, you are forced to make a bad policeman. You are forced to make a mutant, but maybe there are all kinds of neighbors or proteins that are forcing you to be educated into a good one, at least in a way. So this is rather a complicated way, but at the end of the day, what we found is when you take down the good P53 from a good embryo and compare it to a mutant embryo, this is the partners when you are a good P53. Not too many. These are protein partners that are binding to the good one. And this is when you have a mutant. When you have a mutant, the cell makes a decision. You are not going to be anymore a mutant pre-53. We are going to re-educate you. We are forcing you to be folded in the correct white p 53 And if we do that, then you are born normal. It's amazing. Nature tells you that there is a way to bend uh, or educate or teach a wrong P53, a corrupted po a policeman, into a good one, even though he has a bad character, has a bad genome. So what are really these protein? They are very interesting protein, but the most interesting part here are these proteins which are called chaperones. A cell can lose the structure in many situations, in many diseases. Basically, you lose the scaffolds of good cells. Also, the P53 somehow losing the scaffolds. It's sort of collapsing. And these chaperones are like spray that keep you stand up and take care that you will be in a good shape. These are the chaperones. So we understood that there must be a certain way which proteins can be changed, can be re-educated to good, uh, to good or functioning protein. That was really the most important inspiration that we thought, if nature can do it, maybe we can mimic that in the laboratory. Here are the chaperones and other all kinds of important protein. So that sort of study, we draw the conclusion that mutant P53 protein can be refolded into a wild type P53, a good P53, and that is happening in an embryonic system. So we did a whole study, and you will hear later a very beautiful study presented in a different direction, where we have screened for little peptides uh, that will interact with the mutant P53 and may maybe help modifying the structure. So we joined together. This is a. This is me. You can tell. This is a <laughs> Professor Moshe Oren, who is a, a very nice person, a very nice friend, collaborator, but most importantly, a founder that was working with Arnie for years, doing very fundamental work in understanding the gene of the structure. So we were lucky, and as we say every day, Moshe has 30 years of experience, Varda has 30 years of experience. In the building, we have 60 years of experience. Let's take this experience and go ahead and look for these little peptides. And actually, this is a long walk. I will not elaborate. There is paper published. And the whole idea was very simple. Take a mutant, which is like that. The M goes like that. And convert, convert it to a, the other way around, which is the Walter P53. That is very nice as a slide, but that was almost three years of work, of uh, <laughs> looking for these small peptides that will do their job. And Perry, the guy in the picture, really made a wonderful work where he screened libraries for these small peptides. The idea was to find peptides that, when interacting with the mutant P53, will change the conformation and become good wild type P53. I'm not going into details. Anyone, and there's no time, can go and look in the literature. It's published, and this is the way of screening. Basically, we ended up this long, a adventure of looking for such peptide, and we actually isolated a group of little small peptides that can educate a mutant P53 
into become a wild type P53. And this is really only one such representation where you take, for example, an ovarian cancer, and we all like ovarian cancer because they are 100% mutated for P53, so they are prime target. You can take any, any tumor, whatever you want. Not whatever you want, that is too exaggerate. You can take, we took a great number of lines, we tested them. In most cases, you have an effect where you kill, basically, the cells when you treat them with the peptides, and there is a way to show that this is done by a way that the wild type P53 knows how to function, which is activating the proper target genes. And here is just one slide to show you that these are mice that you induce to develop, and then you start treating, the, treating them with a peptide, and the tumor disappears. I have to tell you, I'm many years in cancer research, but that picture is one of the one which I think is very convincing. We have here other experiments, other measures, different types, and all in all, what I would like to say, that these proteins, which we refer as PCAPs, uh, PCAPs, are really converting the mutant P53, what we call conformation, into a wild type P53. So, what I was suggesting here are two different strategies. The one is to stop the process of LOH, and we are still at the beginning of that part of the project. And the other, once there is a tumor, maybe we can convert that tumor or the mutant P53 expressed in these tumors and prevent progression. So either stop the process or stop progression and uh, back, back it up. So for the two last rows of people that I promised I will give more explanation, this, remind, this is the reminder of the live for many genomic police. You remember, we have the good one, we have the corrupted one. So our work is really to rewire the live for many genomic police, to fix it, to renew it. So one way is to be sure not to lose the good policeman. And this is why or when we will understand how LOH is functioning. If we keep that, we stop the process of tumors. The other one is really we educate this corrupt policeman, and this is what we are doing quite successfully, at least in mouse model, and then really upgrade the leaf for many genomic police. And what you have in your slogan, I think, is uplift. So what we are really planning is to uplift the policemen or the rotten policemen in the live for many uh, genome. We are hoping to start soon a clinical trial, and I believe the next, talk, the next second talk will tell you a little bit more of another strategy which is a little bit advancing us. And basically, these are the good people at the Weizmann Institute near the lab, near the pool of the fish, not zebra fish, which is really, uh, they are all very important partners for that project. Thank you. Varga is amazing, an amazing story, an amazing storyteller. Uh, time doesn't matter anymore, so if there's a question or two, <laughs> You're, you're all here. I know a few people are, uh, have planes to catch, but everybody else is here till tomorrow anyway. So Maybe I would just answer one of the questions ah. that the young people asked me. Could we one day wake up and become live for many founders, and then all the blame on the wall of the world will be on our head? So most of the time, you are not the cause. You are just a chain of events and you are not responsible for that, which started years ago in that lineage that you are coming from. But theoretically, one can wake up one morning, have a baby, and that baby has a mutation in P53, and that could start a whole legacy of a live for many family. But I think most of the people who have a live for many family, that happened years ago, and you heard from the wonderful talks of Maria and Pireno and all these people who start way back from Portugal, or I don't know from where, from Alaska. These people who started with the mutation and brought it on us. So 
Thank you.